DC sniper incident in 2002 was a negotiation. Even though snipers killed a bunch of people, they ended up demanding $10 million to stop shooting people. When they started the communication process, they left a tarot card at one of the crime scenes that said, call me God. Now, that's been misinterpreted a number of times and reported that they said, I am God. They didn't say that. They said, call me God. Big discussion between the hostage negotiators and commanders at, uh, behind the scenes. Commanders were saying like, well, we can't call him God. That'll just empower. We can't call him God. And our response was, so you'd rather people get killed? So understand what the other person wants to call, be called by you. You call them what they want you to call them. You're going to gain the upper hand in the emotional dynamic. Chris is known as the master negotiator, and it's a title that he's earned through his time uh, serving as the lead crisis negotiator for the New York City Division of the FBI, and also as the lead international kidnapping negotiator for the FBI, where he helped develop the skills that are still used today across FBI hostage negotiators. And he proceeded to teach business negotiation at USC, Georgetown, and Harvard Business Schools. In 2008, Chris founded the Black Swan Group, which specializes in teaching uh, how to never leave money on the table by using hostage negotiation techniques. And in May of 2016, he published the national bestseller, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It, to teach people everywhere how to apply the life-changing hostage negotiation techniques in their daily lives. And he's proficient in negotiating with real terrorists, giving him plenty of context to help in the corporate world where companies seem to get uh, legally taken hostage all the time. I know that's how many property managers feel uh, on a daily basis. So Chris, I just want to say thank you for being with us and, and thanks for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's looking forward to the conversation. So let's get into it. Um, Chris, can you start by sharing what was the motivation behind writing Never Split the Difference in, in building the Black Swan Group? Yeah, well, um, we wanted to make sure that we got the system together, the, the Black Swan method, if you will. You know, Brandon and I were working on it. I came out of hostage negotiation and we started teaching together in business school. And we always knew that we needed to get a book out. We just wanted to make sure that we pretty much had uh, the system, uh, again, the black swan method pulled together from end to end. Uh, I didn't tactical strategic advantage that I really appreciate a lot more these days is the fact that we were teaching in business schools part-time MBA programs. Now, what's a tactical advantage of teaching a part-time program? Well, if you're working on your MBA part-time, you're going to school at night, you're working in the daytime. You got a family, you got a job. So we had people apply the methods in their everyday existence uh, to prove that it worked, to get proof of concept. Now, I was just up in Boston a couple of days ago because a documentary is being made about us. And I was sitting with my couple of my Harvard brothers and sisters at the business school and at the law school, and I realized the real difference is they're teaching full-time students, full-time Harvard business school students, full-time law school students. What does that mean? All the data they're drawn from on their ideas are from simulations. They have these students going to school full-time, they're not working. The negotiation scenarios are simulations. Our stuff, on the other hand, was tested in the real world and people's lives every day. So when we got it together, you know, we wrote the book and um, the impact, you know, what else do we like about it? People don't get mad at each other as a result of the outcomes of the negotiations, which 
is really critical for you guys because as you and I were talking earlier, you guys believe in a triple win, which is really basically that everybody feels like they were treated with respect. It's astonishing how agreeable people are after you get a that's right out of them. And I'll give you a I'll give you two real estate examples real quick since you guys are in the residential space. One is a landlord tenant negotiation. And the property manager can get in the middle of these negotiations and does and use and use these exact same skills. So a tenant uh, is having a rent raised by a landlord. And this was about a, a, you know six, eight months ago. It's tough raising rents these days for either side because in many places in the world, there's a moratorium on evictions. It's a little bit like rave, waving a red flag at a, at a ball. Do you really want to kick it off and potentially lose the tenant? Now, some in many cases, the answer is yes, because from the landlord's point of view, they still got bills. Landlord in this negotiation just because COVID is out there doesn't mean that the landlord doesn't have bills. The landlord's got utility bills. The landlord's got mortgages. The landlord's got increasing taxes. Everything's going up. So the tenant literally says to the landlord, I realize that your bills are not going away. Just be And saying this exactly, just because of COVID, you still got bills to pay. You still got utilities. You still got mortgages. All your costs are still going up. And the landlord said to the tenant, that's right. But if not raising the rent is what I need to do to keep you as a tenant, then I won't raise the rent. Now, all the, all the tenant did was get a that's right. I, I, I don't know whether the tenant was ready to pay the increased rent or not, but it, it was a woman. She just wanted to know what was going to happen if she got a that's right out of the other side. What's the other side's perspective? Summarize it. You know you got it right when they say that's right. And then the, the next critical move is to shut the heck up. The uh, woman that, uh, real estate agent that is, gave me the second story that I'm getting ready to give you, um, she's very assertive. And so shutting up for the count of four is hard for her. It's excruciating. She feels like she's having her fingernails pulled out because she does not like to go silent. She wants to make her point. So it's painful for her to, to, to go silent. She's negotiating with a homeowner over inspectors coming into his house because the house is for sale. Now, I know you guys never have inspectors coming in on tenants to look over properties. That happens all the time, right? And the, 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 she wants to put all the inspectors through this property on the same day. And which makes sense. It's the quickest and easiest way to do it. Homeowner does not want to do that. He wants to drag it out. He wants multiple inspections. She finally senses that this process is making him feel like he feels like he's a guest in his house, like it's not even his house. So she says to him, you know, you're really tired of this because you're getting sick of being treated like it's not even your house. And he said, that's right. And she said, how do we solve this? You know, if they don't give you the deal in the silence after they've said that's right, in the four seconds that you got to count to yourself, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, and it's not one, two, three, four. It's, you know, drag them seconds out. Then give them a how question. How do we solve this? How do we fix this? How do you want to proceed? Makes them feel in control. And then after she said, how do you want to solve this? He said, yeah, let's go ahead and put everybody through at the same time. So get a that's right out of people, whatever your dilemma is. You get a that's right not by telling them why you think they should do it. If you're encountering resistance, get a that's right out of them by repeating back to them why they think they shouldn't do it. That's how you get a that's right. Whoever it is, if it's your landlord, if it's your tenant, 
summarize their perspective. Go silent for four long, excruciating, painful seconds. And if they don't give you what you want, then one more step before you start suggesting is, how do you want to solve this? Now, they still might not come across. They, I'm telling you, they will. But then your last move is a no-oriented question. Is it ridiculous if I give you some possibilities? That's how you get your gateway to begin to lay out what the options are. You're, you're only going to get to the no-oriented question at the end one in a out of a hundred tries it's going to solve itself for you on the way and the unlikely event that you still got to mediate this somehow is the is the is the go between between these people this still preserves the triple win everybody's got to feel like they were treated with respect they are going to be much more compliant when they feel that way man Chris, that was great. Uh, <laughs> what a great way to start. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, what gets people stuck in the win-lose mindset as opposed to in that triple win, more collaborative approach um, where, where people are compromising or splitting the difference. And how can people get into this practice of, tactical empathy where they're looking for a that's right first that you, you believe gets the best results? Yeah, well, they get stuck in it because they're predisposed to it to begin with. I mean, everybody, every human being on earth, every human being on earth, even vegans, have the same emotional wiring. Sorry for all you vegans out there. I'm teasing you. You know, it's called the limbic system. Uh, most people haven't heard of the limbic system, but most people have heard of the amygdala. You know, you've heard the amygdala hijack. All of this combines in your head. Your default wiring is your survival mode. Your default wiring is what kept the prehistoric caveman alive. You know, they had to be principally negative in their thinking to survive versus optimistic. The optimistic caveman got eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. Because they said, you know, I realized that last time we encountered a saber-toothed tiger, it ate Chris. But I'm optimistic. This one's probably a nice pussycat. I'm going to walk up and pet it. And he got eaten. So he didn't have any descendants. But we've all inherited this default wiring. Now, the amygdala is 75% negative. Neuroscientists have mapped this little organ that's in the center of our head, kind of the, the crossroads of our limbic system or the command post of our limbic system. And three quarters of the space in that organ in your brain is dedicated to negative thinking. We've, we've, you know, human beings, neuroscientists have mapped it with functional magnetic resonance imaging viewing, which watches the electrical activity in your brain when you're thinking. So the people you're dealing with to start with are in the win-lose mindset because they already start out by being negative, which is the importance of the summary, summarizing their perspective. Now, one of the reasons this works is neuroscientists have shown this. This experiment's been done a number of times. They put people in fMRIs. They show them a picture that uh, causes negative thoughts. You know, it could be a puppy dog in the rain, could be a little old lady on a street, you know, it could be a homeless person. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. The picture makes them think negative thoughts. And they show them the picture and three quarters of the amygdala lights right up. And then they simply say, what are you feeling? This is the process of labor. Just identify the emotion that you're feeling right now. And when the person identified the emotion to themselves, the electrical activity in the negative part of the brain diminished every single time, every time. Not some of the time, not half the time, every time. Now, the critical issue here is the degree of diminishment changes 
based on a variety of things. How tired are they? What they have to eat? What time of day is it? You know, whether or not they got a good sleep last night, all factors beyond your control, which is why when you summarize their perspective, you need to hit on as many of the negatives as possible. That begins to get them out of the win-lose mindset because they were there to begin with. The negative thinking was win-lose. They were predisposed to that because they're human beings. So you begin to start the, the summarization of that's right process to begin to pull them out of this mindset. And as you slowly pull them out of it and they see that you're treating them with respect, then you start to move into the collaborative mindset into what you're driving for, which is a triple win. But I understand people are like that, not because of anything you've done. They're like that because that's their natural default wiring, which also means that's your default wiring. And the same process will work for you. And I use it on myself all the time through a variety of methods. I mean, you're all familiar with gratitude exercises. And why should you do that? Well, it puts, gets you out of the win-lose mindset. Because you started that way just by waking up. And your mindset is important, probably the most important aspect of this whole thing, because you're not going to pull them out of the win-lose mindset while you're in it. And this mindset attention is very much like hygiene, oral hygiene. Wait a minute, you're telling me that I have to brush my teeth yesterday? I did it yesterday. You're telling me I, I got to brush them tonight if I brush them this morning? Yeah, it's, it's hygiene because your natural human wiring causes you to pay attention to your oral hygiene, your personal hygiene, two, three times a day so that you're healthy. Your brain is the same way. To keep yourself out of the win-lose mindset yourself, gratitude exercises. And I, I'll give you one more hack. Curiosity. I mean, if, you, if you're genuinely curious, you're not in a win-lose mindset. You're not in a negative. It's impossible to be negative and curious. Instead of thinking like, I wonder what your problem is. You know, what's the tenant? What tenant? What is your problem? Landlord, what is, what is bothering you today? Well, that's, you know, that's, you can tell from my tone of voice, it's accusatory, but you know, wow, what's what's going on with you today that, that that's got you thinking like that? I, I what what are you what are you struggling with? What 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 happened to you? Genuine curiosity automatically takes you out of the win lose mindset, which then sets the stage for taking them out of it too. That's really great. Hey, if you guys are appreciating this so far, feel free to put in the chat, you know, what what's really going uh, getting you going here. We'll, we'll make sure we get that feedback uh, back to Chris here. I've got another question, Chris. So how do you define tactical empathy? Man, that is a great question because the first thing is we got we got to get down to empathy. I'm watching a uh, um, documentary the, uh, the other day and, and I can only find it on an airplane so I'm looking forward to getting back on a plane again because it's not released anywhere else called The Human Factor about Middle East peace negotiations to the 1990s. One of the negotiators is talking about empathy, the ability to put yourself in another person's position. That's not enough. Empathy is an action. You don't just put yourself in a position, you articulate their position back to them. You don't just understand, you demonstrate your understanding. And that was one of the things that they got wrong. Because simply putting yourself in another person's position is not enough. You have to show them what you understand their position to be. For example, the... Uh, the woman that was giving me the, pro, uh, the process about the um, homeowner didn't want the inspectors coming in. She understood that his feeling was he was getting treated like that it wasn't even his own house. Understanding wasn't enough. She had to say it to him. You feel like you're being treated like it's not even your house. 
That's empathy, the demonstration. Empathy is an action. Now, tactical empathy. What I described earlier about the amygdala, three quarters negative. The reason the black swan method has put the word tactical in front of that, we're here to tell you that people start out by being negative. Tactically, the smartest move is to deactivate the negative thinking. We want you to think in those terms. If you're going to apply this method correctly, and the fastest way to get to a solution, tactical empathy is the only thing that affects acceleration of agreements. The only thing. Start by articulating the negatives. And that's those two parts are very important. Empathy is a demonstration of understanding. Tactically, we're here to tell you that they're negative to start out with. Go after diffusing the negatives first. That's your smartest, best tactical move. Tactical empathy. There you go. That's great. Um, so let, let's do get tactical, Chris. Can you talk about, there's a couple of techniques of the many that you highlight in your book that I think are right in line with this, which is mirroring and labeling and can you talk a little bit about what these techniques are why they work so well and how do you do them how do you do them <laughs> oh and he waited four seconds did everyone see that <laughs> chris that's if you could if you could define them that would be great now, first of all, if you guys watch Andrew when I married him just now, even though he knew I was marrying him, it was a positive response on his part. You know, even if the other person catches you doing it, it's not offensive. You know, this, and I and I tell you what happened with Andrew, and then Andrew can confirm whether or not this is true. He felt like he wanted to respond and he caught, but then he realized that he was being pulled forward. It was like, and he realized it was a trap, but you saw him smile. You know, he, he knew he was being walked into something, but there was no negative reaction on his part that I perceived based on his, his body language. I'm, I'm open to correction. That's right. <laughs> so mirroring starts with just repeating the last three words of what somebody's just said. That's all it is. And that, that's how you get good at it and you get practiced at it. Now, then, after you've gotten good at it, you can surgically mirror in any other part of the conversation that you want. And you can use it to really gently steer the conversation. It makes people feel heard. It also lets them know that the, you heard the words that they used. You know, it's, it's the best replacement. It's a higher level replacement for what did you mean by that? Because in many cases, when you ask somebody, what did you mean by that? Or what makes you say that? Notice I'm not saying, why did you say that? I'm saying, what made you say that? Get rid of your whys and put, replace them with what. But a lot of people just repeat the same thing back to you, exact same words, only louder. You know, it's like an American overseas. If you can't understand English, I'll just repeat it louder and you'll understand. So Marion gets people, knocks, pulls people out of that and gets them to reword what they just said, expand on it, makes them feel heard. In many cases, the expansion brings you new information that you didn't hear otherwise, or they didn't state otherwise. So mirroring is a great tool. What we see typically is people that are very high IQ, very high EQ. I'm not high IQ. But those that have both love mirroring because it's so simple. It's so effortless on their part. And they love getting stuff done really efficiently. Now, labels, just identifying the emotions and the dynamics. Very much like the self-labeling exercise in the fMRI I just talked about before you sense an emotion, somebody's angry at you, you say, "Wow, ah, seems like I've made you angry. If you think they're reluctant, 
you don't, or you think they feel you're pushing them around. Here's the critical difference. You don't say, I don't want you to feel like I'm pushing you around. That's a denial that's counterproductive, that's guaranteed to prov provoke a negative reaction. The two millimeter shift in the label is, it feels like I'm pushing you around. That two millimeter difference makes a massive impact. It makes you go from being a tyrant to someone who's being honest and fearless and trustworthy because you're being so honest about the dynamic. So in a nutshell, that's mirroring and labeling. Man, that was great. <laughs> I, I want to, we're going to do something fun to end this, Chris. One quick question uh, before we get into that, because uh, before we like play a game illustrating what you've taught us already so far today and a little bit of what's in your book, you know, can you share some insights, not on what to say, but how to say it, how it's done, specifically the famous late night FM DJ voice? Yeah, I will. And, and also, before we run out of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and mention our, our, our newsletter, our blog. I know you guys are going to get uh, an opportunity to, to sign up for this. I think in a follow-on survey is what, what Andrew is telling me. What I'd like to share with you guys is um, a lot of people use the blog, the newsletter, The Edge. It's a phenomenal supplement to never split the difference. You're going to get a long way with just the book and the newsletter alone. Now, even though the newsletter is free, you know, complimentary, and I used to have a friend and uh, the FBI like to say, if it's free, I'll take three. Sounds like a federal government employee, I know. But the real value is it's concise and it's actionable. It comes out on Tuesday morning. It's going to be sent to your email inbox. Tuesday's a good time to get rolling because you got Monday behind you, but it's concise and it's actionable. It's a short, specific, usable framework. You know, I used to get the daily 10-point briefing from the Wall Street Journal, and there was so much information there, I could never get through it. And it didn't do me any good. One of our recent posting is uh, the 10 hidden phrases that reveal negotiations you don't even know you're right. The most dangerous negotiation is the one you don't know you're at. What are the phrases, the key words that reveal those hidden negotiations if you hadn't spotted it? For example, here's what you should do. That's a negotiation. If the word should is there, someone is talking to you about implementation. If they're talking with you about what you should do, giving you advice on action, that's implementation. If you're talking implementation, you're in a negotiation. Somebody's trying to get you to do something. They're trying to get you to the commodity they want from you is your time and your effort. That's a negotiation. So that's one of the recent articles that reveals the dangerous negotiations that will help accelerate your negotiating ability. So the edge is worth it. We put a lot of effort into it. We put a lot of effort into it. Um, we give you valuable information. Please sign up. That's really great. And uh, I'll say this too, that I'm a subscriber to the newsletter and have been for some time. I get it every Tuesday morning. And uh, it's, it's a newsletter that I read every time it hits my inbox. There are just some great gems in it. Just want to affirm my personal experience with that, Chris. And thanks to your whole Excellent. team. I know that helps put it together. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So where were we? I think we were at a quick late night FM DJ voice and then we right. can play uh, we can play play a, play a quick game uh, before we yeah, wrap it up. The key to the late night FM DJ voice is really downward inflection. Just like that. That's what downward inflection sounds like. Inflecting downward um one of our coaches sandy hines really good she says a great way to inflect downward is to tuck your chin it's a great way to do it women often have difficulty doing the late night fm dj voice it's not a low voice it's downward inflecting 
And Sandy pointed out that if you struggle with that, when you say it, if you just simply tuck your chin, it'll downward inflect. It's a deferential voice. There's great power in deference. In many cases, that an aspect of being respected, you show deference to somebody, it's remarkable how compliant they can be. So that's one of the keys to the late night FM DJ, DJ voice, just downward inflection. That's great. That's a practical tip. All right, Chris. This group loves, uh, loves to have fun, so we've got a fun way of closing it out here in our time with you. There's a, there's a game or an exercise, some might call it, called 60 Seconds or She Dies. Um, and we thought we might play, I'm willing to subject myself uh, <laughs> and embarrass myself here in, uh, in the ring, but would you mind explaining to the group how the game works? Yeah, I'll lay out the ground rules real quick. I'm the bad guy bank robber. Andrew's going to be the good guy hostage negotiator. It's Andrew's job to talk me out. We'll simulate being over the phone. We'll simulate this with the real life rules. The real life rules are he can't give me drugs or alcohol. He cannot give me transportation. He cannot give me weapons. And there's no exchange of hostages. You know, it's not like in the movies where Eddie Murphy says, I'll come in if you let five people out or, you know, we'll let your mother come in if you let five people out. No hostage exchange. Nobody goes in. People only come out. Other than that, we'll you know, we're going to simulate being over the phone. Andrew's going to say, ring, ring. I'm going to answer and we'll be off to the races. All right, here we go. Ring, ring. I need a car in 60 seconds or she dies. Hmm. My name's Andrew, and I'll be who you're talking to today. It sounds like you want to get out of this I situation do. that you're in. That would be correct. That's what I need the car for. And it sounds like you really want to see tomorrow. I have every intention of seeing tomorrow. That is correct. Every intention? Every intention. Yep, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get far, far away. And I'm never going to see or hear you again. Now you got 55 seconds. So, Chris. Um, oh! <laughs> All right, you know, I'm going to stop there, Andrew, because you were doing fantastic. <laughs> that was phenomenal. I want to break down some of the things that Andrew did. And the reason I stopped there is because I never told him what my, my name was Chris. And he jumped the gun a little bit. He cheated. He was looking at his notes. You know, his note card stuff. But it, it, here's what he did that was fantastic. First of all, he's nailing the voice beautifully. Absolutely beautifully. He's doing the effective pauses, and he's got his cadence down. So, and I didn't really talk that much about cadence, but um, with the effective pauses, you can probably slow your cadence down, and everything sort of feels comfortable. He locks into it really well. Now, the other thing he did at the beginning, and while he slipped a little bit there at the end, um, but I, and that was not a fatal error. You know, the straw that broke the camel's back didn't break the camel's back all by itself. So one of the things in hostage negotiation is people say, you say the one wrong thing and people are going to die. It's always an accumulation of things. So, and you will make mistakes. That's the other part. You are going to make mistakes. If I was doing this with Andrew and the roles were reversed at some point in time, I'm going to slip up and make a mistake too. So don't be horrified about making mistakes. Don't hold yourself to a standard where you have to be flawless because any given mistake is recoverable from. So he started out by introducing himself, which is the perfect move. Don't use somebody's name on them until they've given it to you. A person's name is a precious commodity. 
he could have said, and he probably would have said well, at some point in time, what can I call you? That would have been the perfect way to try to draw my name out of me. Give me the opportunity to give my name. That's counterintuitive to what a lot of you have been taught. A lot of you have been, have been taught, find the other person's name and then start using it over and over again because the name is the sweetest world word in their language. They love their name. They love the sound of it. While that's true, so many people have had that used against them that they instantly feel the manipulation as soon as somebody as soon as somebody starts hitting them with their name over and over again. Your name is a precious commodity. Their name is a precious commodity. Be careful with it. Don't wear it out. If you have their name, make sure you're using the name that they want to be called. A colleague of mine in the FBI, Charles Regini, he likes Chuck. You know, he's one of the few Charleses that likes Chuck. And he'll introduce himself as Chuck Regini, and people will call him Charles, trying to be more respectful. Well, he didn't say Charles. He said, Chuck, focus in on how they introduce themselves. Another hostage negotiator I know really well, her name is Marcella. She introduces herself as Marcella, and a close colleague of mine that's known her forever calls her Marcy. Now, I made the mistake of calling her Marcy. I don't have that 25-year relation. I heard her called Marcy by somebody I want to be like. I want to have the relationship that she that he has with her. So I'm going to go ahead and jump the gun and use Marcy because he does. Eh, no. She introduced herself as Marcella. So when you do get the name, make sure you use it as they gave it. And then you might even want to be careful and if you sense that there's another way that they would rather you call them, you know, open the conversation back up and make sure you're referring to them the way that they want you to refer to them. I'll give, I'll give you one more example. DC sniper incident in 2002 was a negotiation. Even though snipers killed a bunch of people, they ended up demanded $10 million to stop shooting people. When they started the communication process, they left a tarot card at one of the crime scenes that said, call me God. Now that's been misinterpreted a number of times and reported that they said, I am God. They didn't say that. They said, call me God. Big discussion between the hostage negotiators and commanders at, uh, behind the scenes. Commanders were saying like, well, we can't call him God. That'll just empower him. We can't call him God. And our response was, so you'd rather people get killed? So understand what the other person wants to call, be called by you. You call them what they want you to call them. You're going to gain the upper hand in the emotional dynamic. And I really want to spend some time on the wording on that. Andrew did a great job. He used several labels. He's done his homework. He's listened to some of the videos. He's listened to the master class. He, he's picked up some of the critical things that I've actually said in certain negotiations. So he did his homework and with his practice, and he imagined himself executing that. Perfect practice makes perfect. It's not practice that makes perfect. It's perfect practice. And he thought about himself executing it properly, which is exactly what he did. And having, I, Andrew, that's the first time you and I have done that exercise, right? Get your rehearsals down in your head. And then stick to the process and then let it unfold as you go through it. He didn't revert to any of his other bad habits in the beginning of that. He stuck with the practice, 
the late night FM DJ voice, the downward inflection, the effective pauses, the labels that he picked up. Sounds like you want to see tomorrow. Sounds like you want to live. Sounds like you want to get out of here. Didn't get drawn into the bargaining over, well, I can't get your car, but I can get your moped. <laughs> you know, or I uh, can't get your car right now. It's going to take some time. Any of that nonsensical win, lose, back and forth bargaining, you don't have to do that. I made a demand. I made a bargaining demand. He did not respond to the bargaining demand. Just because I made a bargaining demand doesn't mean you have to come back with, with a counteroffer. I made a demand. He didn't make a counteroffer. You don't have to do that. You kick your emotional intelligence into gear. Use your late night FM DJ voice. Stick to the offense and give yourself the latitude to occasionally make a mistake. Camel that broke the straw that broke the camel's back did not break the camel's back by itself. It's an accumulation, which means that any given mistake is recoverable. Let yourself make mistakes and you'll be fine. Nice job, Andrew. Chris, thank you for that. And loved how you walked through it and broke it down so people could better understand, you know, what, what's going on there and, you know, <laughs> both the mistake and opportunity to improve. Appreciate the feedback uh, as well as the affirmation of, hey, here's what went well. Um, nice job. Chris, thanks again so much for being so generous with your time. That's all for this episode of The Triple Win. Thanks go out to Carol Housel and Jeff Tucker for everything they do to put these episodes together. And we want to remind everyone that you can find more resources, upcoming events, a link to our private Facebook group where the conversation continues in between these episodes with other professional property managers. All of that you can find at rbp.secondnature.com. Again, that's rbp.secondnature.com. Dot com. And until next time, keep transforming what it means to be in professional property management by finding and applying your next triple win. We want it to be true that every time we see you, we see a better version of you and your business. With that, cheers. Cheers.